Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. We're back again with more Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. You all know the drill. Got the ending slides this time for Gold Dragon. Let's go ahead and get started. Life and death. Destiny and great deeds. Answers to mysteries. The search for one's true path. The mind can comprehend all of these, and then such concepts can be written down as a sequence of formulas, a series of lines, a chain of thought. Still, a moment always comes when it is time to wrap up, to reach a conclusion, to put a period at the end of the last sentence. Or should it be an ellipsis instead, an empty space where the description of the end result should be? After all, a century of crusades changed nothing. The gaping world wound remained on the face of Glorian. And yet, something changed within the world wound. It was as if it had lost some of its power. Demons would occasionally emerge from the rifts, but every time they were greeted by groups of dragons that, after one warning, would rain down fire and magic upon them. Strangely enough, some of the demons would come to Galarian unarmed claiming they wanted to learn how to live alongside mortals. After the Battle of Threshold, the commander did not stay long in the lands where the Fifth Crusade had been waged. A new destiny and a new journey awaited him. The lands of former Sikoris became a place of refuge for many dragons. They settled in its mountains, ruined bastions, and numerous gorges. Pilgrims would come from all over to seek their wisdom. The dragon Haliceliax grew estranged from the affairs of simple mortals. He flew to an unapproachable mountaintop not far from Dresden, so as not to be bothered with trivial matters while still being able to observe from a distance and, if need be, come to the mortal's aid once again. Even death could not stop Terendale from being a protector of mortal kind. And even though she could not go to Kenebris, she would often circle over the city and its environs keeping travelers safe from any harm. No one knew for certain where the dragon Severos disappeared to, but there were rumors that he had been spotted flying west towards Varicia and beyond, across the ocean. Perhaps he is somewhere in Arcadia or Tianzia now, living a new life under a new name. Although the commander became the symbol of the Fifth Crusade, there were still those among the Crusaders who were dissatisfied with his decisions. Years later, their words served as the basis for many alternate versions of the history of the struggle against the world war. Many believed that Dresden would have a bright future as an independent political power, but the city never established strong diplomatic ties, remaining in the eyes of the world no more than a willful province of Mendev. With the war concluded, most of its defenders hastily left Dresden, the memory of the terrible sacrifices made in the battle for the city was too hard to bear. Within a century, Dresden had become a dilapidated, insignificant backwater. Queen Galfrey returned to Nerosian with the intent to rule Mendev as before, but as it turned out, Mendevian society was hungry for change. The war-ravaged nation desired new leadership, but the queen would not countenance yielding her authority to anyone else. She believed her duty to her homeland had not yet been fulfilled. Quite a few Mendevians wanted to see Darren Arende inherit the throne. The ward stones from the chain that once guarded the borders of Mendev were carefully disassembled one by one. The angels that had been trapped inside returned to heaven to heal their wounded spirits and prepare for new battles against evil. The Lady in Shadow found a way to benefit from the situation by magnanimously accepting the warriors from the destroyed armies of Botham and Discari, she significantly bolstered the might of the Midnight Isles. Few realized that the commander had effectively foiled Nocticula's plans with his decision to keep the passage between the Abyss and Galorian open. The Lady in Shadow began preparing her defenses in secret. She knew that sooner or later, invaders would appear in her realm, and it mattered not whether they would be demons or mortals. The demon lord Baphomet suffered a defeat, but his ambitions were undimmed. The war wound remained open, and therefore, the war with Galarian was not over. The demon lord Discari suffered a defeat. He bided his time, continuing to plot his invasion of Galarian, and after that, of heaven itself. The cultists that remained on Galarian went mad one after another, 
tortured by the nightmarish dreams their lord sent to them. The Tirabades were adamant about retiring from military service, leaving it all behind and escaping together, but urgent Eagle Watch business forced them to stay for a week, then for a month, then for many years. Even as Anivia cursed their lot, however, her eyes would shine with pride, for she was always the first to admit that Erebeth was not the kind of person who could just up and retire. The storyteller, as old as the tales he collected, continued his travels across Galorian and occasionally beyond. He knew that out there somewhere, there was one story he would never find, his own. Once again, Sela heard the call of the open road. Even a valiant paladin can be prone to self-doubt, and after everything that had happened to her, Sela wanted to sort out her conflicting thoughts and emotions on her own. Once the war had ended, Camellia grew bored and irritable. Shortly afterward, on a moonless night, she vanished. About a month later, an assassin by the name of Maria arrived in Varicia. She had few things in common with the missing woman, apart from a fondness for cutting the hearts out of her victims. Horgus Gorm never saw his daughter again. After the end of the Fifth Crusade, he sold his estate and left for Cheliax, where he successfully married, thus continuing the Gorm line. Having properly fulfilled his duty to the mongrels and, to his surprise, avoided death, Lan was suddenly faced with a choice. What to do with his life now that it wasn't going to end anytime soon? His hesitation did not last long, and just a few months later, he went on a sea voyage to see the world he had saved. Fairy tales and drinking songs oft times mentioned Lan and the commander going on sea adventures together, but whether that was fact or fiction, no one can say. After the war, the Huntress left the commander's service and, having cobbled together a band of ruthless mercenaries out of veteran crusaders, went to the River Kingdoms to conquer one of them for herself. For a handful of years, she ruled over a dozen villages until the local lords joined forces to put an end to her reign. After the victory, Ember simply sat for a long time, staring at the tongues of flame dancing in her hands. Her new powers frightened her. The awestruck redeemed were ready to hang on her every word, and that frightened her even more. She left without saying goodbye to anyone and continued her endless wayfaring along the roads of Galorian, helping the distressed and punishing evildoers. Many worshipped her as a saint, but she would always respond with, Please, I'm just an ordinary girl. Soon after the war, the tireless researcher of all things researchable embarked on a new journey. She had a sudden urge to know how much time it would take to visit every nation on Galorian. She never returned. No, she did not perish. She simply got carried away with another experiment and forgot to come back. Darren and Rende embraced his new life, one that was free of the other. He became more mature, his smile grew colder, and his choice of diversions more elaborate, and he acquired an imperious streak. Inquisitor Leotor's blood seemed to have left darkness into Darren's soul, or had it always dwelt there. Whatever the case, in that darkness, he was free and happy as never before. To his own surprise, Wolgit Jepto became a war hero. Esteem and fame were shortly followed by great wealth. The thiefling did not let his newfound fortune turn his head, but chose to invest the money in several profitable ventures and one charity for street urchins. Within a few years, his signature style came to include a top hat, a cane, and a bit of a belly. He always kept a bottle of his best liquor and two cups at the ready, just on the off chance that his chief would swing by for a visit. After the victory, Soseo returned home together with his brother. Now a famed crusader hero, he humbly officiated at a temple of Shellin, painted, grew sweet-smelling fruits, and made the best wine in the region. His kindly smile faded only when people asked him to recount his experiences in the war. He would not deny them, but he would speak without embellishment, so that not a single listener would feel tempted to pick up a sword and leave in search of a hero's glory. The love the commander and Soseo shared became the stuff of legend. They were depicted on canvases and cast in bronze, and poetry and songs were written about them. Even years later, romantics across Galarian would address the object of their affection as the commander of my heart. When he returned home, Trevor restored the shield of Shellen to its place in the church and swore never to pick up a weapon again. He tried to rediscover his wood carving skills, 
but his wounded hands betrayed him, no longer willing to create beauty. The tormented fighter lived a quiet, peaceful life, helping his brother with his vineyard, all the while trying in vain to forget the horrors of the abyss. Regil Durange wrote a treatise on waging war against the demons, both a practical manual and a philosophical exhortation. And once that was done, he succumbed to the bleaching completely. He was posthumously and reinstated in his order and buried with honors in the officer's cemetery. His treatise was used in all future wars against the abyss by mortals, angels, and devils alike. Before he died, he managed to send a letter to the commander. Did it contain sincere farewells or a list of directives? Impossible to say. No one was privy to the contents except the recipient. The war changed Grey Boar. He left the assassin's craft behind and embarked on a search for his family. It took years to win their love again, but he had never been one to back down from a fight, and so he won that battle as well. Grey Boar hung his axes above the fireplace and became an upstanding citizen. The transformation was difficult for him, and many a time he would reminisce about the days of his daring youth. Still, there was one joy in family life that the dwarf would not have traded for anything in the world, his daughter, Mora. She grew up to be an exceptional warrior, and watching her train brought Grey Boar true happiness. Arushalea had changed her nature, completely ridding herself of evil, but she would not dare to live among mortals. She took up residence in a small house away from their settlements. Shortly afterward, rumors began to spread. Some said there was a kind sorceress living in the cottage, or perhaps a reclusive saint, and people would come to her asking for help. She never refused anyone, and in time, she earned their trust and friendship. And what of me, the writer of these words? The half-demon witch known as the architect of the world wound. I joined the side of the person I had previously fought against. I saw the error of my judgment and the rightness of his. I helped to restore the world I had mutilated. I was saving it, healing it, up until the moment the wound on my chest claimed my life. I have recounted the story of my life for you, Phrasma, Lady of Graves. Not only of my life, but of the Commander's also. I believe the tale of such an illustrious figure would pique even a goddess's curiosity. Now you know everything. I await your verdict, goddess. Silence hangs over the boneyard. The Lady of Greys is weighing her decision, and it seems the entire universe is holding its breath, awaiting her pronouncement. Who would dare to break a silence so absolute? intervene though you are no longer here your mythic powers entitle you to a say in this trial diplomacy i appeal to your mercy the planes have suffered enough do not add to the evil already wrought with yet another act of evil your words ring out in the silence they are heard considered and given their due weight the laws of the universe have existed for millennia. They are incontrovertible. But even they allow the decider of fate some degree of influence over the verdict. You wrought great evil. But your deeds stemmed from evil done to you. You have acknowledged your guilt and done a great deal of good. Even the one who suffered most from your endeavors now appeals to me on your behalf. I see that now your soul is clean. I shall send you to Nirvana, plane of peace and spirituality, which is what your soul needs now. So be it. Now you, the mortal who has risen so high as to stand boldly in the presence of the goddess of fate, you have done the impossible, and you will be remembered as long as this universe exists. Go, live out the rest of your life. I look forward to tales of your future deeds. And that is the end. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a like down below, share this content, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.